some bad news. I know it. I love when he does that. I got another mystery that's coming up in the next segment that I want you to solve for me. Tony Schiavone interviews FTR and Tully Blanchard. And we'll get to it in a minute, but we've got we've got a mystery. It's a riddle wrapped in an, an enigma surrounded by a conundrum as to who the heels are in this issue. And secondly, apparently one of the Bucks has disappeared. Apparently, Balding Buck possibly has recently undergone surgery at the Cy Sperling Hair Club for Men's Center in Edina, Minnesota. He's missing. His, we've seen his foot, but none of the rest of him. Possibly he's now just a disembodied foot. Perhaps, so, perhaps he's embarrassed by his brother's acting skills. And by the way, his brother's name is after, uh, of course, the passing of Road Warrior Animal. We have retired Road Warrior Buck. I think the, the best name that I saw, I think we're going to go with this from now on, due to his no-selling and kicking of everybody's ass at his completely unintimidating physical size and stature and his smarmy, smart-ass smirk to begin with that scares no one, Buck Hogan. Ah, that's good. Ladies and gentlemen, Buck Hogan and Balding Buck, the Young Bucks. Anyway. A lot of people recommended Bruiser Buck. I was thinking, yeah, how about but... Dick the Buck? <laughs> Dick the Buck. <laughs> we may use that. <laughs> Balding and Dick the Buck. We'll use it in this one anyway. So... Tony Schiavone is interviewing FTR and Tully Blanchard and cash knocked the good buddies, the best friends, whatever their name is. He put SCU over his athletes. Dax ran the bucks down. They're doing a heel interview about how the bucks are, you know, goofy and they're doing the goofy backyard stuff, right they're, They know that that'll get some heat with that audience. We've tr blazed that trail. Um, of course, he has to mention Dave Meltzer giving him the stars and everything. So he, he's a heel with that childish audience. Uh, but anyway, suddenly as they're doing a heel interview, the heel team, the champions with a heel manager, suddenly two feet appear in the screen and super kick Tony Schiavone. Poor Tony Schiavone, who's, I believe, 62 years old and never a trained professional as far as taking bumps and so it looked like shit and it was phony to begin with but you see then dick the buck but you never see balding buck at all you saw two feet and then and and dick the buck refers to balding buck but did you see was this show live 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 no second chance at anything i'm not sure this segment certainly wasn't well, this was a pre-tape in the back. One would think that they would. I'm, uh, Raw, uh, the WWE, sometimes these backstage segments are actually live, believe it or not. Or at least they used to be. So you never know. If this wasn't live, somebody ought to be fired. It looked so ridiculous when Tony Schiavone, out of nowhere, while FTR is talking to him, gets super kicked by two people, allegedly, that we didn't know were there and... FTR Tully didn't even register it. Nobody. It was just they just looked like oh, like a fucking blase cell. Well, that shouldn't have happened. Kind of expression. And then this fucking douchebag, Dick the Buck, says his heelish shit. And then come on, Nick, and the unseen brother, and they walk away, and FTR's just standing there, and, and nobody's even looking at Tony Schiavone, who is allegedly still laying on the ground, writhing in pain. This was this was past phony. I, I wrote, horrible, why would you do this, question mark? Heel team with heel manager, cutting heel promo, and then here come the baby faces who have switched into whiny heels to sell this program. Blindside the announcer to uh, allegedly build the match or the issue. And then JR and Taz and excrement had to react to this. I said, well, they shouldn't have done that. Well, what would happen <laughs> if on a, an NFL game, if one of the players just suddenly didn't like who one of the uh, 
on the field announcers was talking to and just ran over and whacked that fucking announcer over the head with his football helmet. What would the reaction be like? People would be losing their minds. Why then? Why? What's the difference here? Why would? Why wouldn't the programs, if they were going to do such a stupid, phony thing as this, then if they, why wouldn't the programs shut down, stop down, and everybody be clutching their pearls and threatening lawsuits or whatever? At least, if you're going to do something, do it. But this is just outlaw bad indie wrestling, and I swear to God, if. I'm surprised Jr. didn't say in the next segment, well, we can't gr- grieve forever. I guarantee you he said it off the air.
Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to episode 226 of the Hoots Podcast. It's Thursday, October 8th, 2020. Hope you guys are having a wonderful week so far. It is yours truly, the nefarious brother Adam. You can follow me on Twitter at the Hoots Podcast. I am on Instagram, Joshi Lopez94. That's J O S H I E Lopez94 on Instagram. And if you'd like to see me do some cool guitar covers, make sure to check out at Josh Lopez Music. We're a live podcast. We're also a pro wrestling podcast that pop, doesn't pop blood vessels over booking. So if this is your first time listening to the Hoots Podcast, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to listen to my shenanigans. And um, thank you for being part of this journey. Um, and as we see on with the thanks and everything, I just want to say thank you to everybody that's been a loyal listener, a loyal good brother, a loyal good sister uh, to the Hoots Podcast over the last four years. We officially passed 200,000 downloads on Anchor since we started uploading these shows on Anchor last year. And it's a really cool accomplishment and it's thanks Basically, and solely because of you guys, and I want to thank you guys for the support that you guys do care about what we talk about here on the Who's Podcast. It's a brotherhood podcast. Uh, I want you guys to feel like I'm sitting next to you and we're talking about professional wrestling, and I hope this podcast could be a positive escape for you as you guys uh, trudge around during this pandemic era and we're still in the middle of the election season. So, with that being said, welcome to the program. We got a lot, a lot to talk about this week. Got to recap NXT TakeOver 31 uh, following uh, our opening monologue segment here. Also got to get into this week in WWE. We got the draft coming up tomorrow night as I'm recording it's on a Thursday. And we got Hell in the Cell around the corner. The G1 is almost on the final leg of its tour. I'll give you an update on that later on in the podcast. Of course, we got everybody's favorite segment. What the hell is wrong with A E W? And boy, do we got a lot to get hit on uh, with that segment this week. As if the intro wasn't a cliffhanger for that. Anyway, um, also we have a brand new edition of the Thoughts of Derrico, uh at the end of the podcast per ritual. And, um, yeah, so we got a lot to get into. So, last bit of plugs really quick. If this is your first time listening to the podcast, or even if you've been a listener since 2016, do do us a favor. Please subscribe to the Who's Podcast so you never miss an episode when it comes free of charge. We don't pay you for it. We don't charge you for anything when it comes to the Who's Podcast. It's free. You can check out all the previous episodes or past interviews I did. And, um, besides that, if you, if you subscribe... And especially for those who use Apple Podcasts, please leave us a review. Uh, I'd like to gauge how you actually feel about this podcast. What can I improve on? What do you like about the podcast? And even if you have a comment about today's wrestling or something that this, uh, something you're thinking about with wrestling, put it in the review section. We'll give you a shout out on there. So, uh, that's pretty much it. And then, of course, bookmark pro wrestling transcriptions.com. It's my website where I do result articles for basically every televised wrestling company around the world. So check out ProWrestlingTranscriptions.com. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's have some fun. Uh, over the last couple weeks, we started this new thing where we have a Q&A segment uh, in the beginning portion of the podcast. And I want to thank the good brothers who take the time to send out the questions each and every single week, especially the man we're going to start off with here, Chris Zaletta. Uh, you can follow him on the Twitters at X Team Zuleta, uh, I think I got this right here. X Team Zuleta 24X on Twitter. Make sure to follow him. He is a good brother. He sent a bunch of questions as always and always, uh, down to answer them. Here we go. It says, Hey Josh, here's some questions for the show this week. Who are some of your favorite music producers? Well, I think for me, for those who don't know, uh, my musical background, just how I view music. I have a very wide range of thoughts on music. Uh, I don't really um, cling to one genre of music over another. I love everything, um, with the exception of Justin Bieber. Um, <laughs> but uh, my favorite music producers, uh, it, it, it changes throughout the week. I mean, you could go to George Martin. Um, I... Uh, George Martin, who did a lot of the stuff with the uh, Beatles back in the day. Um, 
the old producer for the Eagles. Uh, I forgot his name, but he was in the, in the UK as well. Uh, oh, Glenn Johns. Glenn Johns was the uh, producer for the Eagles. Uh, Eagles are my favorite band for those who don't know. And uh, he produced a lot of the early records. Um, you, you could look throughout the rest of the list. Uh, Dr. Dre is one of the greatest producers of all time. Uh, Tim Blinn's another great producer. Uh, there's a lot of tremendous producers out there. So those would be the ones that stand out to me. Next question. Favorite Bulls championship team? That's a great question. Um, have you guys, by the way, have you guys seen The Last Dance yet? It was phenomenal. I think for me, my favorite Bulls championship team was the 1996 team because it was just sheer dominance. And, and for the fact that, yeah, Michael did come back in 95 halfway through the season and they got B or land in the playoffs. I understand that, but just for him having that layoff with playing baseball and then coming back and having one of the greatest basketball seasons ever and the team is 72 and 10 and uh, I just think dominance was the main thing it was really cool and of course uh the Bulls won the NBA title here at the United Center on Father's Day which was a special moment for MJ after the passing of his father so that would be the one that really stands out to me. Um, next question. Do you think Giannis leads the Bucks? I think Giannis uh, should lead the Bucks if he wants to. Not if he's being peer pressured because a lot of people just rather see him in a bigger market. I really don't look at sports from those lens. Uh, I, I, I always support the athletes to do whatever they want to do or where they want to play. And I do believe in loyalty, and I'm not really the biggest fan of super teams. So I do think Giannis will leave somewhere down the road, but I would have a lot more respect for him as a competitor and as a player and a star if he could fix the issues with the Milwaukee Bucks instead of bailing out like Kawhi Leonard. Okay, you got a ring with one team, and now you want to join a super team just to rip off LeBron and all these other guys from this 2010 era of basketball. Next question. Should NXT use more pay-per-view names for TakeOver, like No Mercy, Unforgiven, No Way Out? I think they should. And I, I, I mentioned this on Twitter last night. I think it's really cool that NXT is bringing back Halloween Havoc uh, towards the end of the month, and I think that's really cool. And Shotzi Blackheart is hosting it, and she's tremendous. So, yeah, I... It just depends when you do it. If NXT is going to start doing monthly specials, then you can probably implement names like No Way Out or Unforgiven or Judgment Day, uh, NXT Cyber Sunday, probably down the road. <laughs> um, I, I think so. It just depends when they do it. And I think I, I, I will give props to NXT for the fact that they do hark into the past and try to come up with cool ideas and concepts for these takeover specials during this pandemic era of wrestling. They brought back In Your House, which I thought was a great event, one of the best NXT events of the year. And I think um, Halloween Havoc would be a lot of fun. And so I, I wouldn't mind it. I just think if you're going to actually do monthly NXT takeovers down the road, then you could probably add the names of No Mercy, Unforgiven, or Judgment Day. Um by the way, WWF No Mercy, one of the greatest video games of all time. All right, <laughs> next question. Favorite NFL Madden year? Oh, boy. Well, <laughs> it's definitely not one from the last five or ten years. I'll, I'll start off with that. Oh, man, this is really rough. Um... I'd probably say any of the uh, Madden games that uh, came out in the mid-2000s are probably the ones that stand out to me. Uh, for me, my favorite football game of all time actually was not Madden-based. My favorite NFL game of all time was ESPN NFL 2K5. So that's why I'm kind of struggling with this one. Because Madden, Madden, like, I, it's okay. Some years is better than the others, but I think... NFL 2K5 was the best football game of all time, in my opinion. Um, next question. Thoughts on Ali being the leader of Retribution? 
I'm glad I could answer this in this opening monologue segment. This is a great part about doing this going forward is that uh, there's so much wrestling to talk about throughout the week that I tend to forget certain things that I do want to address. And there's a lot of things that I have to process and spew, spew out to you guys each week because I have a website and I'm breaking down all these shows in detail and I'm trying to remember and process fucking 30 hours of wrestling before I record a show for you guys every single week, and it can be difficult at times, so uh, I I want to make sure that I leave no stone unturned, and I talk about everything that's going on, whether it's something I like or something I don't, uh, something I do like or something I don't like, and um, when it comes to Ali being re- uh, the leader of Retribution, I think it's great. I mentioned this a few weeks ago uh, when I did my rant about folks just trashing Retribution just because of the names T-Bar, Slapjack, and Mace. I think a problem with today's wrestling and today's wrestling fans is that we assume everything because we think we're in the boardrooms of these professional wrestling promotions and we're not. When I criticize AEW, I'm criticizing them for their in-ring content. That is the analyst's point of view that I'll come from, from because to me, in-ring wrestling is the most important thing. You can throw me promos, you can have storylines, you can do have all that window dressing and all the extra stuff. What do you do in the ring is what matters the most. And I'm not going to come on here and talk about booking decisions. I just think that's stupid. Uh, it's subjective. It's something that I'm not going to lose sleep over. And I think a lot of a lot of us as wrestling fans and people who do shows like this fall into the trap of, okay, let me assume what my take is so I can have people listen to my show instead of actually paying attention to the content of the shows and actually obtaining some context before dishing out these hot takes. Uh, I had a lot of thoughts on who was going to be the leader of Retribution. I thought it was Shane Meek Mahan. I thought it was Adam Pierce. And then looping back to the hacker, which I mentioned a few months ago when this thing first started, that ha- the hacker had something to do with retribution. And then, in some odd way, because this is how wrestling Twitter works, we find one thing in real life and thrust that upon professional wrestling, and people think that retribution is a knockoff of Antifa, which was never the case. And I really think Retribution is a good example of letting things play out and actually try to apply some context to pro wrestling instead of looking at things off of, uh, based things off of first impressions. I don't believe perception is reality all the time, especially not in professional wrestling, because when you have a televised wrestling product like the WWE, yeah, you may not get all the answers you want on a particular set episode, but it's episodic for a reason. You're not going to have all the plot points and all the loose ends on every single wrestling show, because then what's the point? If you're having a 52 week Base wrestling television show, and you're dropping your load, if you will, on every feud that's going on and telling you everything why this is happening, why that's happening. Then what's the point of having the television show? Just have a streaming service like New Japan. Like, what's the point of it? You, that's why you have television, so you can have those questions to discuss, figure out where things are going. Yeah, sometimes Raw has loose ends with their storylines. But that's the point of television. The wrestling television model is totally different than something of Breaking Bad and Game of Game of Crap or The Sopranos. This is a totally different distribution model. So I think Retribution is another good example of the fact that a lot of people need to take the time to take a step back, apply some context before we assume what's right and what's wrong. Yeah, us hardcore fans know that's Dijakovic and Shane Thorne and Mia Yim and Dio Madden and Mercedes Martinez. We know who they are, but casual fans don't. And then, and you look at the same people that are in that group, every single person, especially their ringleader, has a valid reason to be in the group. Why, why, what, what is the inner circle? Why are Santana and Ortiz in a circle? Why? Because Jericho's friends with Conan and AEW couldn't come up with a cooler idea for Santana Ortiz after they decided to leave Impact? 
We need to revise any remaining interest in Jake Hager. Retribution have people that belong in that group. I, likewise, to the Hurt Business. You, if you're going to have factions, you need people to valid, the fit and validate the faction that you're having in the first place. So, I love the idea. I'm happy for Ali. I don't think this has anything to do with race or the fact that he's Muslim. I think that was another stupid talking point on Twitter. Yes, Ali is going to be a wonderful fa- baby face down the road. He's a tremendous wrestler. I love him. He's a Chicago guy. I got to meet him at an AEW show. He's an awesome fucking guy. And a talented wrestler. Now people are going to give a fuck about what he's doing. Instead of throwing a hissy fit about the fact that he's on main event every week. You know, sometimes you guys put WWE in a position where they can't win. Okay, why is Ali being stuck on main event? Oh, he's a leader of retribution. Oh, why is, they, why is he thrusting Ali on a bad uh, faction? How do you know it's going to be a bad faction if you don't let it play out? So... Favorite wrestling event you have attended? Um, I'll give you two. One that I attended here in Chicago, then one that I went out of state for, okay? Uh, my favorite wrestling event I went to here in the city of Chicago is pretty easy, especially for those who know this podcast. It's uh, Money in the Bank 2011. Uh, it was the night that I decided that I wanted to work in professional wrestling for the rest of my life. So that, that'd be the one from home. And then uh, as far as Going to events out of the state, I say WrestleMania 31 in Santa Clara was just one of the coolest events I ever went to. I went to WrestleMania 22, which I think is an underrated WrestleMania. Uh, WrestleMania 31 is one of the greatest WrestleManias of all time as well. So, uh, Money in the Bank 2011 and WrestleMania 31 are the ones that really stand out to me as far as my favorite events that I went to in person. I've been very spoiled <laughs> in Chicago. Uh, when it comes to the wrestling events I've went to over the years, I won't lie about that. Uh, what do you think of a Cole Styles Cole Balor stable in the future? Um, I don't think that WWE is going to do a Bullet Club reference based uh, stable or faction. I just don't think they're going to do it. So that's my answer for that. And then I'm leaving this last question for, uh, for Chris uh, for a particular reason. In or out on Matt Nagy? I'm in on Matt Nagy. I'm not out on him as a head coach. I'm out on him as a play caller. I want to make that perfectly clear. You could be a head coach and be an effective good coach. Let's not misconstrue facts. Matt Nagy has been 23 and... Was it 12 or something like that? 23 or 14 since being the head coach of the Chicago Bears, a former NFL coach of the year. Matt's a wonderful dude. He's great at the media. Matt's a great leader in the locker room. He's brought a good culture here in Chicago. I've never taken that away from Matt. I think he's a talented guy. And he a lot of people buy into what he says. There's a good culture out there. And, you know... The, going from Mark Tressman to John Fox, I'm happy with Matt Nagy. Yeah, last year was disappointing, an A and A season. However, I thought last season had unwarranted Super Bowl uh, expectations, and I don't have enough time here on this podcast to give you my thoughts on the full evaluation process of how Mr. Trubisky's been handled locally here in Chicago or by him, uh, Matt Nagy. And I don't have enough time to talk about it. But my focus is on him now. For so many years, I've heard this thing about, oh, Mitch is holding back the offense because he doesn't have the full grasp of Matt uh, Matt Nagy's system. Okay, a system's a system. You're not Andy Reid. Show your chops as an offensive genius. If you can make Lamar Jackson, who's... Runs similar to Mitch, more faster than he does better cuts than Mitch, but both of them have similar throwing issues. If Lamar Jackson can win an MVP and bring the Ravens to the playoffs in a pretty simple offensive system, why can't you do that with Mitch? Which you were doing the first two weeks of the season, but... Okay, he throws a bad pick in the second half against the Falcons. You gain your feelings because this year, uh, people are ready to rush 
Matt Nagy, Mitch Trubisky, and Ryan Pace out of the city because that's the city city of Chicago for you. And you use Mitch Trubisky as a scapegoat to bench him just because you have your guy that you have experience with and he's with the system. Mitch, uh, Nick Foles knows the system. And I have all these fucking people telling me that Nick Foles is the second coming of fucking Kurt Warner or Drew Bledsoe. And it's like, give me a fucking break. I like Nick Foles. He's the Super Bowl champion. I, I'm not, I'm not going to take anything away from him. I'm not going to take anything away from him from what he did with that Eagles run. That was very impressive. But I don't know how we put Nick Foles on a pedestal, but you have a guy like Joe Flacco who people just dis- disregard what he does because he basically had the same run <laughs> to the playoffs with the Ravens when they won their last Super Bowl as Nick Foles did. So I'm not out on Matt Nagy as a head coach. I'm out on him as a play caller because this is the same guy who feels like he needs to get rid of Jordan Howard and all these people who who doesn't fit his system, yet we're still barely scoring 25 points a game. So is it really on the players or is it on your stupid scheme? I'm I'm out on him as a play caller. So, Chris, I want to thank you for the questions, man. That was awesome. Uh, I got a couple more questions before we go into the uh, the next uh, segment here. I'm going to tie in some stuff, pal. Let me scroll up really quick. Uh, I got a question here from the good brother, uh, King Edward 15, Petty Guerrero. Uh, Ed, uh, thank you so much for uh, sending the question, my man. Um, he says, best slash wrestling slash rap song or reference in a song. I don't know if it's a reference in a song, but if you guys go check out the music video for uh, Real Motherfucking G's from um, Easy e Easy has an awesome Chicago White Sox hat, so that would be my answer to that question. So, um, let's see what else. And then uh, we got a couple questions here from the one and only Nate the Great. What's up, brother? Make sure to follow him on Twitter at Cycle Nagiri. Nate's been a good brother since the pipe bomb days. Pipe bomb days. Swig of water right there. Do you think trilogies in wrestling are too long? Three months of the same feud gets tiresome after no payoff, in my opinion. Uh, I don't think they're too long. I just think a lot of us are um, kind of jaded to the fact that we have 50, 52 weeks of television. And when you have performers fighting each other a lot or having a lot of sex with each other, you can get bogged down by it. It's not, it's not a process like New Japan where they just have events and they don't have storylines and they let things play out and have time to tell bigger feuds um if if there wasn't 52 weeks of television i think you could have better long-term feuds and matches and stuff like that i don't think trilogies are too long it just you need to have the right ones you need to have the right pairings and stretching things out with certain performers for eight months because you have nothing else to do for them is not a good look. So I wouldn't think it's, uh, I don't think trilogies are too long. You just need to have the right people in it. Um, what song speaks to you the most? Oh, this is an easy one. Uh, the song that I think really defines me the most is uh, Sky's the Limit by Notorious B.I.G. So that was an easy one. Um, early predictions for Wrestle Kingdom. Fuck, man. <laughs> um, you know what, Nate? I'll give you um, I'll give you a couple matches that I would like to see at Wrestle Kingdom this year. And my pick for uh, the main event would be Naito against Ishii. With Ishii winning the G1 this year. That's what I really want. But you can also see Naito against Shingo. You can have Naito against Tanahashi again. Um, There's a lot of choices for Naito. If he's still the IWGP heavyweight champion at Wrestle Kingdom 15. Oh man. I I could definitely see Okada fighting uh, Ibushi or Suzuki. 
I I would love to see uh, Shingo uh, Shingo take on uh, fuck. I'm trying to remember his name again. I I, I think it would be really cool if Shingo and Will Osprey had their match on the Wrestle Kingdom stage. They had a great one at the Best of Super Juniors. I just transcribed uh, transcribed one uh, last week during the G1. Uh, they had a fantastic rematch. So I would love to see Shingo and Osprey three at Wrestle Kingdom, and then you could figure out the rest of the card from there. Uh, I heard something about Will Osprey wanting to fight CM Punk at Wrestle Kingdom. If that ever happens, I think that'd be cool. Obviously, I'm a CM Punk mark, obviously, but uh, those are the couple matches that really I would like to see down the road. Um, I don't know if we'll see. Hopefully, we don't have a match with Hiroshi Tanahashi and fucking uh, Zack Sabre Jr. again because I've seen these guys wrestle 50 million times. So. <laughs> Uh, I I love to see Hiroshi Tanahashi against Kenta, you know, a little something different. But those would be my predictions for Wrestle Kingdom. We, we can pick out of the litter. It's just I I think New Japan's in a very uh, interesting position right now because we we're still stuck in this pandemic. So uh, what matches can you really do for Wrestle Kingdom? That's box office where you can't bring other people from other promotions out to out to Japan. So. I have no idea how much longer this fucking pandemic's gonna be, but we gotta make the best out of it. Uh, does the superstar make the tower? Or does the tower make the superstar? Well, I, I think the the superstar makes the title. Uh, you can have a prop, but people still don't give a fuck about you, or people are sitting on your uh, people sitting on their hands while a title match is happening on a pay per view. That's a reflection on you. They're giving you the responsibility to hold the weight of that division. Obviously, that's why they're giving you the title. So if you can't garner interest, and that's some things people forget too. It's not always just what the win-loss bookie decision is. It's on you as a performer. If people are not into you, if, if you're not going out of your way to make people care about you, no matter what is being scripted for you or what people backstage are telling you, it's on you to get yourself over and I think in more cases than not, it's the superstar that makes the title. And if, if that's the case, you wouldn't have transitional champions. If you had people holding money to bank, uh, bank briefcases, you wouldn't have people having to defend it because people would care about you cashing in the briefcase. So I think the superstar makes the title. I think the superstar makes the money to bank briefcase holder. I think people uh, superstars make uh, tournaments. I like Keith Corbin. He won the King of the Ring. He, it fit with his character, this heel persona. So I think superstars make the titles. So I want to thank Nate the Great, uh, Ed, and Mr. Chris Zaletta for sending some awesome questions this week. You guys are fantastic as always. Um, we're about to head into our next segment, but uh, really quick, and take a swig of water. Then when I come back, we're going to recap NXT TakeOver 31. We'll be right back. All right, ladies and gentlemen, back here on the Who's Podcast. Time to talk about NXT TakeOver 31 from the revamped uh, Capital Wrestling Center in Orlando, Florida. Vic Joseph, Wade Barrett, and Beth Phoenix on the commentary for NXT TakeOver 31. Um... You know, I don't know anybody in the world that's five bad takeovers. I, I'd probably say the first NXT takeover in London in 2015 was kind of meh, in my opinion, to be honest with you. But um, I've, NXT takeovers have been fantastic ever since, and this is the 31st version of said event. Really quick, I want to get a couple of thoughts on uh, the Capital Wrestling Center. Uh, really cool. Uh, layout, love the opening video package where they had the old footage of Capital Wrestling, uh, which was really the start for the entire McMahon family because um, Vince Sr. Uh, was in charge of the WWWF, the Worldwide Wrestling Federation, and went to the World Wrestling Federation, and here we are today with WWE. And uh, it was really cool to see that. You had Ray Morgan uh, do a play-by-play and uh, get a hearken back to uh, the tradition of professional wrestling. And, 
you know, just, I, I really enjoyed that open. I thought that was fantastic. Uh, the layout, the structure of it. Yeah, you got the video boards for the Thunderdome. I think that, that's, that's just going to be the case with a lot of entertainment, uh, outlets until this pandemic's over. So that, that aspect really doesn't bother me. I really do, I really do like the, the pods, uh, in the, chain lane fence around the ringside area it's like got that gritty feel to it i think the stage looks awesome and um to revamp the performance center into the capital wrestling center i just think that's fucking cool so <laughs> um i know it's a pandemic going on but i like to visit the capital wrestling center as soon as possible so i i want to give my thoughts really quick on the the transition there because i thought that was really cool and then now into the action, we started off with the Barican good brother, uh, Damian Priest, retaining his NXT North American title over Johnny Gargano. Very, very good match. Uh, a couple cool spots where uh, Priest did the razor's edge onto the apron, which was uh, Priest's move. Uh, I'm not the biggest uh, Johnny Gargano fan, whether he's a heel or face, but I thought Johnny did a good job. In this match, and um, Priest is a star. I think Priest could be box office down the road, and um, he just has it, man. He has everything you want in a WWE superstar, so I really enjoyed that match with Damian Priest and Johnny Gargano. Then we had a very physical ass whooping session with Kushida and Velty Dream. That's what that's what that's what it was. <laughs> um, yeah. Kushida defeating Velty Dream. Uh, basically, Velty Dream got got on Sunday. So that was my thoughts on that. And then we had the NXT Cruiserweight Championship match with Isaiah Swerve Scott and Seth Santos Escobar, a.k.a. King Cuerno, against Killshot from Lucha Underground, a real wrestling alternative product. Um, <laughs> uh, this match was fantastic. What's really unfortunate sometimes with this where you have a finish where it doesn't come off as smooth and, and some people uh, look at that and they take away their overall views of the match because the finish doesn't, doesn't go 100% clearly. That's that's the double-edged sword of professional wrestling, man. It's a physical business. Uh, these are trained professionals um, and sometimes... Stuff like that happens where Isaiah was had was supposed to actually hit the buckle, but he mistimed it. And uh, I know that Escobar did the butterfly uh, face buster to uh, get the pinfall there, but I don't <laughs> I don't want that miss uh, time spot with uh, Swerve to take away from what Escobar and Scott did. I think it's really cool that. The Cruiserweights got a title match on a takeover. And especially both these guys being the ones to do it. And they have great chemistry in the ring with each other. I love their matches. I've covered each one so far. And um, I hope they have another one down the road. And Santos Escobar, just like I mentioned with Damian Priest. Uh, you can have Santos Escobar in any division. And just because he's a cruiserweight champion, don't think that he could have a, a legitimate shot down the road to be a NXT champion. So uh, I really enjoyed the match with Santos, Escobar, and Swerve Scott. And uh, it's unfortunate that Swerve did miss the buckle towards the end of the match. But I don't want that to be the only takeaway from that match because it was really good. If you haven't watched it, please go out of your way to check it out. And as I'm going on with this show... I got to say, man, Vic Joseph and Wade Barrett and Beth are a good booth. Uh, it, I can't tell you how much commentary means to professional wrestling, especially now in this pandemic era of wrestling, because the, comment, the commentators are the narrators of your story, of your product, of your show. And if they can't guide you along, then the show's going to feel odd. It's a... A weekly um, uh, thing I run into when I watch AEW shows. They have a bad booth. Uh, I think uh, SmackDown's booth is okay. I, I like Graves and Cole has good moments. Uh, I think the Raw booth is bad. 
outside of Samoa Joe. Uh, I think Tom Phillips is the worst play-by-play commentator in wrestling outside of Josh Matthews. Uh, NXT UK's booth is fantastic with um, Andy Shepard and Nigel McGuinness. I think their booth is fantastic. Uh, and commentary, especially now, is so essential to the enjoyment of what's going on right there because you don't have the full ambience of an actual professional wrestling show right now. So there's no excuse for your commentary team to sound like ass. Look at uh, New Japan. They have a fantastic announce team. I, I don't know what the hell they're saying half the time when I'm covering these G1 shows because I only get to see the Japanese co- uh, commentary version of these shows. But they bring more energy in those shows than Tom Fields does in his entire lifetime. So, <laughs> um, I, I just think uh, Vic, Wade, and Beth should get a round of applause for what they've been doing. They did a great job Um on Sunday night, uh, calling that event really quick. I gotta say this, you know, one <laughs> every week we do a podcast here. I've always find one way to bring a waterfall reference. I don't know what it is, and this speak between me and you guys. Like maybe since Candace turned heel, I just find it to be more and more sexy. You know, like I don't know what it is particularly. I always thought she was a beautiful woman. Let's not be misconstrued here, but maybe it's the way she's doing her hair. I I I, I don't know. I <laughs> her waterfall game seems to improve as the weeks go by. So I'm just saying that really quick. But now we can get back to the wrestling portion here. I'm just joking around. Don't get in your panties about it. Uh. I thought the match with EO and um, Candice was fantastic, too. I don't want that match to go under the radar. Uh, I thought that was a fantastic NXT Women's title match. Uh, Candice brought it. EO is still one of the best female wrestlers in the world, in my opinion. And they had a fantastic match. Uh, EO retained over Cassidy Ray. But the biggest news that came out in the match was two additions to the NXT Women's Division. First, the return of Ember Moon, which was really nice to see her uh, back at NXT, and I think she'll have a good run down there. Um, as evidence of last night in her match with um, Dakota Kai and Raquel Gonzalez, that was a pretty good tag match. And um, also, what got me really excited, because you guys know I'm a big NXT UK fan, we saw Tony Storm uh, make her presence known, and the thing about a match of EO and Tony Storm is going to be... Uh, a barn burner, pal. <laughs> so, uh, some good business there. And then, what do you say about the main event that hasn't been already said? You know, like, Kyle O'Reilly and Finn Balor on paper is just a clinic even before the bell rings. And after the bell ring, it was just even more fantastic. Um, I, I love the match. I love the physicality. I love the selling you know, you can, you can still sell <laughs> in 2020. Um, Kyle had a fantastic performance, and he was having a lot of pressure put up put upon him uh, going into this event. And he delivered. He delivered. And I thought he did a fantastic job. So I want to give a shout-out to Kyle O'Reilly. Uh, Finn Balor did retain. He's still your NXT champion. There was a couple injuries that came along the way for both guys, unfortunately, but nothing too serious. And speaking of injuries, because uh, it's played into uh, how NXT TakeOver 31 went off the air, uh, looks like Rich Holland suffered a bad leg injury on last night's NXT episode, which was really unfortunate. But uh, best in speed recovery goes out to Rich Holland because I'm a big fan of his work. So overall, man, I really, really enjoyed uh, NXT TakeOver 31. That Balor O'Reilly match was one of the best matches I transcribed this year. Uh, one of the best NXT title matches of all time. And it was a fun event to cover on a Sunday night. So, with that being said, let's transition into this week in WWE. And with that, uh, in this segment, I'm going to be kind of breaking down and uh, telling you guys uh, what to expect for the WWE Draft because it starts tomorrow night. Night one of the 2020 WWE Draft starts on Fox. Um, 
It's Friday Night Smackdown, and Smackdown has a big card, too, to check out. Uh, we got Biggie and Sheamus in a Falls Count Anywhere match. Uh, I believe it's um, Kevin Owens against The Fiend. That was another match I saw that was announced for that event, and yeah, it's going to be a pretty cool night on Fox tomorrow night. Uh, I, oh, of course, I can't forget the marquee match that everybody's been waiting for five years. Sasha Banks versus Bailey for the SmackDown Women's Championship. And I'll tell you right now, there will be shenanigans and somehow Bailey retains. And we got to figure out what this, what what's the proper conclusion for Sasha and Bailey where they can pause things for their feud, go their separate ways. I do believe this with the draft. Sasha and Bailey need to be on different brands. So uh, we need to figure out how that's going to play out. But I think for me, if it was me, I would have Sasha win the SmackDown Women's title tomorrow night on Fox and, and then have Bailey be drafted to Raw. And then you could have uh, the rematch at Hell in a Cell and leave it at that. If they want to push this out to where fans come back and it's a WrestleMania match. Obviously, Bailey retains, and then Sasha can find a way to win the Women's Royal Rumble uh, in 2021. And then you can have Bailey and Sasha at uh, WrestleMania 37. So that's how I would play that out. And that's the thing we're talking about the draft, and um, you know, the, <laughs> uh, Sasha and Bailey are going to play a big part in that tomorrow. Uh, there's a lot riding into that match for both ladies and the SmackDown brand and where these are going for both superstars. And uh, you know, Sasha and Bailey are in a big spotlight. Sasha is a mega star. She's a big time player. She's one of the best uh, wrestlers in the world. And it's time for her to showcase that tomorrow night on Fox. I'm looking forward to, to the match. All right. So I'm going to read a portion here from uh, Fox Sports. Uh, Ryan Sam, really quick, congratulations to him. He uh, made a decision to join the Fox Sports digital team. So he'll be uh, covering WWE now for Fox Sports. And I think that's really cool for Ryan. Uh, Ryan, came, uh, Ryan broke down a article where he got the exclusive uh, draft pool and rules for the draft. So I want to go over this with you guys and uh, we can talk about this. Uh, really quick, in the review section on Apple Podcasts, I want you to give me your mock drafts for the WWE Draft in 2020. Who would you like to see on particular brands? What we do know right now is that NXT will not be part of the draft. So NXT will not be part of the WWE draft this year. But I want to know, give me your mod dress. Who would you like to see on particular brands? And I love to get your guys' thoughts. So here we go. Fox Sports has attained the rules of this year's WWE draft as well as the superstar talent polls available for each night. Just like last year, WWE Chief Brand Officer Stephanie McMahon will preside over the WWE draft to announce draft picks for Raw and SmackDown. Meanwhile, executives at Fox and USA Network have been working with WWE management over the past few weeks in regards to their preference for draft picks. Here's what we have been told are the rules for this year's WWE draft. More than 60 male superstars, female superstars, and tag teams have been placed into the 2020 WWE Draft. Since Friday Night SmackDown is a two-hour show and Monday Night Raw is a three-hour show, for every two picks that SmackDown has, Raw will get three extra picks. Tag team still count as one pick unless Fox or UC Network, in conjunction with WWE officials, want to pick one superstar from the team. Any undrafted superstars will immediately be declared free agents and be able to sign with the brand of their choosing. And here are the draft pools. So this is what you can look out for tomorrow night, okay guys? The draft pools for night one is stacked. So here we go. On this draft pool list, it says Asuka, Sasha Banks, Bianca Belair, Dana Brooke, Humberto Carrillo, Elias, Angel Garza, Drew Gulak, Heavy Machinery, The Hurt Business, My Number One Waterfall, Mickey James, Lucha House Party, Drew McIntyre, Buddy Murphy, The Mysterios, da, uh, Naomi, New Day, Roman Reigns, Ricochet, The Monday Night Messiah, Seth Rollins, Mandy Rose, Sheena Baszler, and Nia Jax, since they are the WWE Women's Tag Team Champions, Chad Gable, AJ Styles, and Jay Uso. So those are the lists there for the... Uh, 
uh, Friday draft pool. So here's the people that can be drafted on Monday. Okay, we got Andrade, Bailey, Alistair Black, Alexa Bliss, Daniel Bryan, Carmella, King. Cor- By the way, nice to see Carmella back on television this week. Woo wee! Uh, <laughs> King Corbin, Apollo Cruz, Nikki Cross, Dabakato, Dolph Ziggler, and Robert Roode, Eric, Lacey Evans, Charlotte Flair, Jeff Hardy, Billy Kay, Lana, Keith Lee, The Miz, John Morrison as the tag team. Riddick Moss, Natalia, Titus O'Neil, Randy Orton, Kevin Owens, R Truth, Retribution, The Group, Matt Riddle, The Riot Squad, Pete Royce, Arturo Ruas, Sheamus, Shinsuke Nakamura, and Cesaro, The Street Profits, Braun Strowman, Tamina, Akira Tozawa, Selena Vega, The Fiend, Bray Wyatt, and finally, The Undisputed. WWE Intercontinental Champion Sami Zayn. So, I just broke down the rules right there for the WWE Draft. It's very, it's gonna be very interesting, you know. Uh, they do the WWE Draft every year, and I mentioned it last week that I, know, I didn't think that we need to have a draft before WrestleMania season. I kind of like the reshuffle the decks after WrestleMania season, but this is the cards we have, and I'm I'm excited, you know. I'm, I'm the, I'll be the first person to tell you that I don't mind seeing repetitive television matches because I understand that I can take a step back and understand that these weekly television shows, it's nothing more than plot points. So I really don't lose sleep if we're having the same matches over and over again because the final product is on the pay-per-views. So we know the drill here. With, we have the draft. We'll have new rosters, but... The conclusions of those three is going into Hell in the Cell will happen at Hell in the Cell, and then we reshuffle the deck heading into Survivor Series with new stuff and new content as we get closer to WrestleMania season. So there's a lot of different ways to go with this, you know. I, I'm excited. I have my thoughts on who I like to see on different brands. Uh, I mentioned it already. I think Bailey and Sasha need to be on different brands. I love to see uh, AJ Styles back on Raw. I like to see. Nakamura and Cesaro go to Raw as well. Um, you know, maybe you can have Steph Rons at SmackDown. I I wouldn't be opposed to that. I, I wouldn't think that'd be a bad idea. Um, I like to keep the hurt business on uh, Raw. It feels up to me. Let's keep the hurt business on Raw. And then, you know, you can pick out a litter out of anybody. Like, there's a lot of different choices, but. I'm I'm very excited for the WWE draft and they have a good opportunity to reshuffle the decks and maybe get people excited for new potential feuds and matches down the road. And um let's see what happens. Sorry and I have Fox, so that's the rules for the WWE draft. Really quick, uh other takeaways from this week's editions of Raw and SmackDown. I wanted to mention that uh really like the stuff that's going on with Randy Orton and Drew McIntyre. That was fantastic. Uh I love their feud. They're going to have a Hell in a Cell match for the WWE title. Uh, the Tribal Chiefs ceremony with Roman Reigns and Jey Uso was fantastic as well. So uh, two strong title feuds going into the Hell in a Cell. And I think those are good choices. And i um, excited to see both of those matches. Uh, speaking of good matches... Um, we had Seth Rollins and Buddy Murphy against uh, Carrillo and Dominic Mysterio. That was a good match. Uh, Buddy Murphy attacked Seth Rollins after a um, little confrontation over the fact that Seth Rollins is trying to expose public, uh, Buddy Murphy uh, publicly through tr- trying to drive a wedge through the Mysterio family. And the Monday, my, Monday Night Messiah continues to kick ass, and people still don't understand it. But, hey, man, when you have a good heel... And he does what he does on weekly television. Of course, that will go over your head because you guys can't really tell what an actual heel is anymore. So, so cool stuff on that end. And then, uh, what was I going to say? I thought Sami Zayn and Jeff Hardy had a really good uh, Intercontinental Championship match from SmackDown last week. Uh, I wanted to give a shout-out for that. And then finally, you know, the stuff with Alexa Bliss and... The Fiend is really interesting, you know. We had uh, Kevin Owens have a new edition of the Kevin Owens show 
on SmackDown with Alexa Bliss and uh, the Fiend and Tech have it on That's why these guys are fighting each other on the draft tomorrow night. And uh, we'll see where it goes, man. I'm excited. Uh, that should be a lot of fun. So, uh, love to see Alexa Bliss on my television screen as always. And I think The Fiend's doing some good stuff as well. So, that's my thoughts on this week in WWE. Let's take one more swig of water and then we're going to get into an update for the greatest tournament in all professional wrestling throughout the calendar year. The G1 Climax, third A. Alright, we're back folks. Uh, here on the Who's Podcast. Make sure to subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. Right now, we're going to talk about the G1 Climax 30. We're about 10 days away from the finals of the G1 Climax tournament. Uh, 10 days until this freaking tour is done, and I can give my fingers a break for a little while. <laughs> but, uh, man, just been grinding and pumping out these G1 articles for you guys. I hope you guys have been enjoying them. Uh, I've done 12 so far. Obviously, there's been 12 events. I did one this morning before I recorded the podcast today. Which was a B block event in uh, Yokoyama, and uh, it was a cool event to check out. And uh, I'm just gonna go over the scoreboards really quick before I give you my thoughts of the matches and uh, what you can expect this weekend. Uh, so this is to catch everybody up on the A block side. We have a four way tie at first with eight points, which uh, pertains Jay White, Kota Bushi, Okada, and Will Ospreay. We have a four-way tie in second place uh, with six points where we have Ishii, Suzuki, T- uh, Shingo, and Taichi. Jeff Cobb has four points and then rounded out for the eight block. Yusuro has zero points. Now on to the B block. Tied for first place with eight points. Uh, no, for first place we have Naito with ten points. And second place we have Evil with eight. Uh, we have a five-way tie at third place with six points. Those wrestlers are Hiroshi Tanahashi, Juice Robinson, Hiroki Goto, Sonata, and Zack Sabre Jr. Uh, we have another t- uh, tie here towards the bottom end of this block where we have Kenta and Toriano who have four points and Yoshihashi has two points. So those are the updated standings there for the G1. You know, man, just looking back at some of the matches I've transcribed over the last couple of days, especially, this has been insane. Like, you look at Ishii and Taichi from Tuesday was fucking insane. No, uh, from Monday was insane. Uh, you had uh, Abushi and Osprey as the main event it was a fantastic match. Um, Okada's had a couple good string of matches recently with uh, Suzuki and uh, Jeff Cobb this week, which was was really good as well. Uh, Jay White's been on a little bit of a losing streak uh, that ended yesterday <laughs> when he defeated Taichi. So good to have the switchblade black on the. Um, scoreboard and then you look at the B block matches you have um you know I thought Sonata and Kenta had a pretty solid match today uh you look at what happened on let me roll this up here on Tuesday uh Yoshihashi and I had a pretty good match as well uh Kenta's being the Zack Sabre Jr uh one of my favorite matches from that day in Cork and Hall from this past um no not Cork and Hall what am I talking about uh, in Hiroshima, uh, we had Evil and Juice Robinson. I thought that was a fantastic match. Uh, same thing with Naito and Hashi. Hiroshi Tanahashi beat Kenta on Tuesday in the main event for the B block. Uh, then you go into um, Wednesday, yesterday, we had uh, Osprey tear the house down with Suzuki, which was fantastic. And then the main event of that show was Shingo upsetting Kota Ibushi. So that was a really big win for Shingo. If you guys haven't seen that match with Shingo and Kota, go out of your way to watch. It's one of the best matches of the year so far. And then for today, Goto had a good match with Hashi. That was a fun one to jot down. I have no comment on Zack Sabre Jr. and Toriano. Um, <laughs> I mentioned Sonata and Kenta. Uh, Naito and Robson had a fantastic bar burner today. Uh, that's one of the best beat block matches of the tournament so far, featuring one of the funniest palm strike exchanges I've seen. <laughs> they're doing a palm strike thing where they're like 
Naito is mocking Juice the entire match. He's doing the whole Juice thing, Juice jabs. <laughs> He's mocking Robson. And then Robson is mocking Naito as they're trading palm strikes with each other. It's fucking hilarious. If you guys haven't seen that match, go check it out. I gotta say this. I'm not into this uh, evil Dick, uh, Dick Tubble thing. I understand your heels and you want to boo them. It's just a bad look for Evil right now, man. He looks really, really generic since joining Bullet Club. It's not a good look for him, man. It's really not. I really think Dick Togo is bringing Evil down. Not for the fact that he's a heel. It's just entertainment-wise, it's, it's just not a good look. And uh, I was really, I was starting to really get into the Evil match with Tanahashi today for the main event. And then fucking Togo throws a chair at Tanahashi's face right in front of Red Shoes, and it's not even a disqualification. Like, I understand that New Japan is loose with their rules and what they allow at ringside, and some of it's fun and entertainment when Suzuki does it or whoever, but you have a fucking manager he- heaving a freaking chair to somebody's face, and you're not even throwing, you're not even going for the disqualification. I don't know, this stuff is a bad look uh, for New Japan there, so. Uh, here's some of the matches to look forward to. We have two. We have an event on Saturday in Osaka for the eighth block, where we have Jay White taking on Yujiro in a Bullet Club versus Bullet Club match. We have Ishii against Chef Cobb, uh, a rematch from uh, last year's uh, G1 that I really enjoyed <laughs> right now last year. Uh, Will Osprey against Taishi. That should be an interesting matchup. Abushi against Suzuki. I'll tell you guys right now, I, t- I really, I think there's a chance that Ibushi and Suzuki could steal the tournament uh, on Saturday as far as the best matches of the tournament uh, is concerned. I'm looking forward to that a lot. Okada's taking on Shingo. Uh, that'll be the, the main event for the A block on that day on Saturday. And then Sunday, they're in Aichi. And we have Zack Sabre Jr. against Yoshihashi. Kenta against Toriano. Uh, Sonata gets Juice Robson. That should be a good one. And then uh, Hiroshi Tanahashi gets Roki Goto. Um, you know, these guys fought each other in finals of G1 Climax tournaments over the years. And then we got Naito and Evil as the main event on Sunday. So, a lot of things to look forward to for the G1. If you haven't had a chance to watch any of these shows, I recommend you guys check out ProWrestlingTranscriptions.com. I share some of the Twitter clips of the match so you guys get a little glimpse of it. Uh, as you're reading through the transcript. But uh, make sure to bookmark ProWrestlingTranscriptions.com. I have a reference sheet attached to every G1 article that I do. So you can follow up, follow along with the matches. And the match cards for the upcoming events. So thank you guys for the support for the G1 coverage. It really means a lot to me. So yeah folks. That right there is your G1 Climax 30 update pal. <laughs> Alright ladies and gentlemen. It's time. Once again, for everybody's favorite segment in professional wrestling. The best segment in all pro wrestling podcasting. The one and only, What the Hell is Wrong with AEW? And we're going to start it off with Brother Carter in 3, 2, 1. It's time for What the Hell is Wrong with A-E-W. What the hell is wrong with A-E-W? Okay, let's start from the very beginning. Brian Cage takes on Will Hobbs in a match that was boring and sluggish. There was a couple of okay moments, I guess, but... And there was nothing riveting about the match at all. I mean, they had these two brute guys who I know are very talented, but they didn't display it in, in their match tonight. And Darby Allen comes out, who I actually really like. I like Darby Allen a lot, but he comes out and it was a very anticlimactic. Like he comes out, kind of half-heartedly runs to the ring. FTR kind of slowly backs away, which leads me to believe that Allen is going to turn and then hit Will Hobbs. But then the segment just kind of slowly ends with, Taz saying some crap on the mic, and then the segment just ends. It was ridiculous. Awful way to end that segment. Darby Allen can do so much better. Speaking, well, no, not even to do that. Okay, let's talk about the tag team divisions, shall we? So here's what you're telling me. A team 
Actually, by the way, when I said uh, Cajun, um, I think I said Darby Allen needed to run off uh, Cajun Hobbs. I don't know why I said. I was just so focused on the next point that I need to make. Let's talk about the tag team title, shall we? I was so high on this division, and it, there was so much promise for the tag team division. But just like everything else in AEW, it's being squandered and it's being wasted. And the tag team division, clearly, okay, so they think that rankings are supposed to be this huge major deal, right? And, oh, rankings are, are, are you know, we're going to let everybody know who's in the tag team rankings and all that kind of good stuff. So you're telling me that a team in Hybrid 2, who has been on AEW Dark, and we haven't really seen on AEW Dynamite, gets a tag team shot, title shot. In a match that was mediocre at best. Boy, those rankings, they mean a whole lot, don't they? Man, just like everything else in this company, they put focus on rankings, ratings. It's absolutely ridiculous. What is this, 1990s WCW? Boy, that company did really well, didn't they? Okay. Speaking of tag teams, put the Young Bucks in the ring. They absolutely suck backstage. They can't cut a promo. Their acting skills are god-awful. It's ridiculous. The Young Bucks in the ring, fantastic. Love them. Outside of the ring are complete garbage. Complete garbage. Pretty much anyone on the mic, anybody in the elite besides Cody is a part uh, is absolute garbage on the mic and we're going to get to cody here in a little bit I, I, why would anybody want to be a part of the dark order i just don't get it the only one who's really doing it for me is anna jay and she's clearly in a league of uh, she's the superstar of the dark order it ain't Brody lee it ain't colt cabana it sure as hell ain't evil uno or five or ten or whatever the superstar of the dark order is anna jay Speaking of Brody Lee, he, of course, and here's your other, or, and I shouldn't say Peter Brody Lee, but his opponent, Cody. Here's another shocker. In Cody's return match, he books himself to win the TNT title now that he's done with his uh, new show. Oh, what a surprise that the, comp that the boss is going to put the title back on himself. Shocker. Oh, that's a shocker. We tried to get Brody Lee over so I could go away for a while. Now that I'm back, I'm putting the title back on myself. Pretty much... Pretty much completely gives merit to the fact that he is just like Jeff Jarrett and is wanting to build the company for himself. And it basically killed the entire Dark Order storyline because now their leader has lost the title. Absolutely ridiculous. The last thing I'll say in this segment this week is let's talk about Chris Jericho's 30-year celebration, shall we? So his 30-year celebration was against a mediocre tag team, uh, Chaos Theory or whatever their name is, they're terrible. Jake Hager is terrible. Chris, this should have been Chris Jericho's retirement match because I'm sorry, Jericho. I love Chris Jericho, and he is he is one of the greatest of all time. But you gotta know when to stop. Jericho doesn't know when to stop, and really, this mediocre tag team match closes the show. They get a segment with MJF, which is kind of funny. I actually like that. Um, but the rest of it was absolutely horrible. This whole program, by and large, was terrible. AEW Dynamite this week, by and large, was a piece of crap. Seriously, what the hell is wrong with AEW? This has been What the Hell is Wrong with AEW. Thank you very much, Brent Carter. Oh, boy. Okay. So, I know we're coming into the one-year anniversary of uh, AEW, and I'm, I'm listening to uh, Hoodie's podcast, Tuesday Wrestling uh, Tuesday, the other day, and I know uh, he wants me to come on, and we should do uh, a year interview of AEW and I'm really trying my best to make sure that I'm not coming on here and yelling and making a fool out of myself like JD from New York and I want to make this clear when I uh, criticize AEW 
It's because their in-ring stuff makes no fucking sense. And it's an insult to the wrestling business. You know, I can make exceptions for smaller wrestlers being main event guys. I can make exceptions for comedy wrestlers having bigger spots down the road as far as being a main eventer or whatever. There's certain things that I could take a step back and I said, hey, you know, this is today's wrestling. You should evolve this and that. But in my heart, I am a wrestling traditionalist. And as a wrestling purist, this show is pure grade A homogenized Holstein Daily's place. Bullshit! I'm still surprised that people will stare at you with a straight face and tell you that AEW is the best wrestling television show going on today. And look, I'm the first person to say all wrestling is subjective. So everything I say, you guys can disagree and cool, I won't judge you for that. Objectively, from my point of view, and as a guy who covers a lot of these wrestling promotions, and I spend a lot more time covering non-WWE promotions than I do the WWE, this show, particularly on television, AEW Dynamite, is the worst wrestling television show on the planet today. I will stand on that stance. No matter how you feel about Monday Night Raw and it being three hours, this show feels like four hours. And it all starts with shitty commentary, week in and week out, where JR can't even get the name of Ricky Starks right in the beginning of the fucking show. Now, unlike Brian Carter, I actually liked the Brian Cage will have at the W World Title match. I thought it was a good match. Here's the problem with what happened after the match. So. I'm going to add some positives here, so I'm fair and balanced here, okay? I like the Will Hobbs and Brian Cage match. I thought it was very good. I think Will Hobbs has a bright future ahead of him. I, I liked what he's done on AEW Dark, and I'm a Brian Cage fan. I like what they did, so let's get that out of the way. In, in real life, you know, every time you listen to the Rusty Podcast, you always hear people say, oh, what, WWE doesn't do stuff that makes things look realistic, right? Okay, so you have two guys, two legitimate guys, two badasses, two badasses in their own right, Brian Cage and Rick Stars. You know, Taz is getting this ultimatum, either Will Hobbs joins Team Taz or he gets his ass kicked. So, you have a guy who's fucking chiseled out of granite and the guy who's street tough in Ricky Starks, right? They're in the corner, they're cornering Will Hobbs. Out comes fucking scrawny Darby Allen with his skateboard, this time with no thumbtacks. And these two are backing away from him like if he's fucking the big show. Really? Uh, it's, it's cool for you two to gang up on a guy that's freaking twice Darby Allen's size after the match, but you're going to back away from him. Don't you notice how odd that looks in real life? If somebody Darby Allen side starts running at me with a fucking skateboard, I'm kicking the skateboard in his fucking face. I just thought that was stupid. Speaking of things that are stupid, uh, AEW's tag team division. So let me get this straight. FTR leads the WWE, goes on the soapbox on Talk is Jericho about how Vince McMahon doesn't care about tag team wrestling. Uh, he, he treats it as a joke. Uh, they rather, he rather focuses on personality and comedy than actual storylines for tag team wrestlers. So, okay, FTR take on the hybrid too. Dr. Wrestling in it was fine, but you have a heel versus heel team on television. That's more of a match that you see on AEW Dark. I thought the wrestling in the match was fine. I'm not knocking FTR. I'm not knocking the wrestling in the match. Let's listen to what I'm saying here. So, FTR retains, okay? They beat uh, at the, the hybrid two. Fine match, okay? So, we see the Young Bucks in their continuous pandering and acting like smart Alec teensters who 
uh, are pussy whipped over the fact that they can't get the girl they want or they're not getting enough tension, they decide to super kick the cameraman on the Titan Tron because AEW has no idea what the fuck to do with them. Every time you watch BTE, they're in their feelings. Oh, it's all in their feelings, and they're turning heels now because it's, it's taken a full year to realize, character-wise, that all these guys from the Elite are fucking schmuck heels. <laughs> that's what they are, and I'm giving them a compliment because that's what they actually are. I'm not saying that Matt Jackson or Nick Jackson or Kenny Olivier are bad people or anything like that. I'm not taking personal shots at them. I'm talking character-wise. They are heels. Look at how Kenny Omega talks to Alex Marvez. You tell me that Kenny Omega is a uh, a baby face? The Young Bucks super, super king everybody and their mother because they're in their feelings that FTR is world tag team champions. So we get this predicament of just like we had it all out, who am I supposed to cheer for? And how long are we really going to stretch out this FTR potential match or rivalry series with the Young Bucks to the point that nobody gives a fuck when they do fight each other? And second thing, I thought FTR left the WWE because they didn't want to be part of comedy, yet every single week they find themselves uh, interacting with best friends. And they're calling FCR weenies. We have pictures of FCR Photoshop in weenies. You know, if, if that if that segment happened on SmackDown or Raw, boy, people would be fucking crucifying Bruce Pritchard right now. But we don't in AW because we have uh, double standards in the wrestling community. Hey, it is what it is. I, I keep it 100 here on the Hoots Podcast. So, the tag team division is a joke. The Young Bucks are a joke. Best friends are a joke. Now you're starting to make FTR look like a joke. Yeah, you do great stuff in wrestling. You cut the ring in half. You hold the tag grills. You do everything traditionally based. I like that of FTR. They got Tully Blanchard. Cool. But it goes back to what I said a few months ago. You could hype up the fact that you have the strongest tag team division in all professional wrestling. But when your tag team matches don't make sense. And when you make referees look stupid. And your storylines are based and rooted in comedy. And people who are acting like petty teenagers are in their fucking feelings. That's, that's not a good look. That's not a good look. Okay? Cody Rhodes... Defeats Brody Lee to become the AEW TNT champion after a dog collar match. I wonder how much they paid Greg Valentine to sleep in the crowd. Honestly, I want to know how much they paid Greg the Hammer Valentine to sleep. Because that was a bad look as well. Then, here we go. Cody Rhodes is the new TNT champion. My first issue with this match was the fact that the bell ring and the referee is just letting John Silver... Stand there on the ring apron like a fucking Nimrod, not throwing him out from ringside. He gets hit, he gets busted open, and a Jake got to come out and bring John Silver to the backstage area. Okay? So we wasted five minutes just because we had to focus on John Silver over the fact the referee's not doing his job after the bell rings. There's a lot of good physicality. Both guys bled. I thought there was a couple good spots in this match, especially Cody doing the. Uh, Cody Cutter on the floor. Cody ends up beating Brody Lee with the crossroads. Okay. Where are we going here? Why? Why are we going with this Jeff Jarrett stuff still? Right there just validated that Cody Rhodes is nothing more than Jeff Jarrett. And this is the same guy that puts himself on a class of Triple H and Hiroshi Tanahashi. If both of those guys were watching their mat, watching that match, they're laughing their ass off. Let's be honest with, with you guys, okay? Like, what good reason does Cody need the TNT title back now? So, okay, you want to give Brody Lee the AEW, t- AEW title match. So it's a consolation prize. You let him hold the TNT title... Uh, for a couple of months because Cody has to shoot a television game show and then he comes back just like nothing. Boom. Okay. Thank you for doing your job, Brody. Uh, you're still Mick Carter as you were in the WWE. 
And then to cap things off here with this fucking match, Tony Khan's favorite wrestler, the greatest wrestler of all time, the guy in his eyes that was better than Stone Cold Steve Austin, Orange Cassidy comes out, and we're having the babyface versus babyface baby face match for the TNT title on Dynamite next week. What the fuck? What is your obsession with fucking Orange Cassidy, man? Holy shit. Oh, man. I thought Big Swole had a good match with Serena Deeb. So we can keep on bouncing things out here. And then the show just ends off with a sloppy... Ugly, mud show, outlaw tag team match where we have the Kobe God and Nyquil Lesnar against Sir Pentico and Luther. Congratulations, Chris, on 30 years of professional wrestling. You're a legend and you're, you're starting to ruin your legacy right now. And this match sucked. I knew it was going to suck before it was booked. I knew the match was going to suck before it rained. This match absolutely sucked. And this is the frustrating part because I want to enjoy this company. I really do. I want it to succeed. I want it to be the alternative. I want it to have sustainable success. But when you have people, you have wrestlers in booking committees and it's fucking the heathens running the asylum, it's just not a good look. There's no filter to AEW, and just because you don't have a writing team or a creative team on AEW doesn't mean it's a good thing because you need to have people to filter and tell you when your fucking ideas suck, okay? So, again, here we are. Another shitty episode of AEW Dynamite, AEW Dynamite before the one-year anniversary, what the hell is wrong with AEW? That's my question for you guys. What in the blue hell is wrong with AEW? I don't know. Maybe I'll never know. And maybe it's not for me. And I could maybe admit that as well. Maybe AEW is not for me. So, okay. We're going to wrap these up right there. I want to thank you guys. So much for taking the time to uh, take time out of your day to listen to the podcast. I want to share a couple uh, words of wisdom here. First, here we're going to start off with The Rock. Um, this little piece of advice here. He says here, just one second, let me pull this up. Uh, come on. Let's go to The Rock's Facebook page. Smell what The Rock is cooking, pal. Okay, let's see here. I think he had a uh, saying about staying true to your word. And um, I really do believe in that. Uh, make sure in any situation in life, you guys stay true to your word. And even if you get into awkward conversations or dialogue with people and it gets uncomfortable, I understand you have to stand your ground and be true to yourself no matter what the situation is. So that was the quote from The Rock. And then my piece of advice, as always, is to be the authentic product that is yourself. And always remember, you dictate the pace of your life. Nobody else, okay? I love you guys. Uh, make sure to subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. Make sure to follow me on Twitter if you like at the Hoots Podcast. I'm on Instagram, Joshy Lopez94, S J O S H I E Lopez94, at Josh Lopez Music on Instagram. Uh, bookmark Pro Wrestling com. Make sure to check out uh, TWT. Go check out the Rant Foundation. Shout out to you, Issa. And. Shout out to Brett Carter, always for the uh, submissions and being a good brother to this podcast. Thanks to all of you for letting us reach over 200,000 downloads on Anchor this week. It's fucking awesome. You guys are the best. And um, thanks to Chris, Nate, and Ed for uh, sending some questions this week. And um, with that said, man, I'm about to head out. I hope you guys enjoyed the rest of your weekend. Enjoyed some of the G1 action. And we're going to send it off right now to Brother Carter in just a couple seconds. This has been episode 226 of the Hoots Podcast. And we're going to toss it off to the Thoughts of Derrico in 3, 2, 1. Yes, sir. 
And now, the thoughts of Derrico. Listen well, man. Welcome, welcome, one and all, to the part of your week that you wouldn't possibly draft away to anywhere at all. It is the thoughts of Derrico, featuring the one, the only, Brother Carter. Man, it has been a fantastic, fantastic week of professional wrestling from the WWE. I was blown away by how much I really enjoyed NXT TakeOver 31. Every match from top to bottom was excellent. I I, I just, you think about the incredible in-ring action, you know, with Johnny Gargano and Damian Priest had an excellent match. Uh, we all know how good Gargano is, and Damian Priest is the real deal for sure. Uh, Kushida and Velveteen Dream, I enjoyed that. Uh, Velveteen Dream, you know, is always great to see him do his thing. So that was really terrific. Uh, let's see. The match between Isaiah Swerve Scott and Santos Escobar was fantastic as well. Io Shirai and Candice LeRae had a great match. Um, and of course, Finn Balor and Kyle O'Reilly absolutely, absolutely delivered an incredible main event. So terrific top to bottom. I'm so glad that Halloween Havoc is back. That was always one of my favorite events of the year, really. Uh, and WCW is bringing that back. That's awesome. Shotzi Blackheart is the perfect person to host that. So I think that's absolutely terrific. That's going to be great. Tony Storm and Ember Moon are back as well to increase and give even more to what I believe is the best women's division in all of professional wrestling, which is an NXT. So it's just a terrific night of wrestling, and I'm so glad I got to watch it. Really great episode of SmackDown this week. Roman Reigns' promo on SmackDown to Jey Uso was just unbelievable. I mean, he's playing it off like he feels sorry for Jey Uso and, and apologizes for what he had to do because he believes he's the tribal chief of the family. I mean, this is... I know I keep saying this, but Roman Reigns gets better and better and better. This is the best Roman Reigns we've ever seen. I know a lot of people are really happy that he's finally getting a chance to be a heel. I think he's incredible as a face and a heel. I think that was absolutely awesome. Terrific. Jey Uso gets another shot at Hell in the Cell. I think it's going to be great. Can't wait to see that match between those two. We may get to see Kevin Owens versus The Fiend. The psychology of that is going to be phenomenal. Kevin Owens is one of the best psychological talkers on the mic. Putting up him up against the ultimate manipulator in Bray Wyatt, The Fiend, could be incredible. I cannot wait to see that. I, we're going to talk about this in a little bit. I would love to see a Fiend-led stable between The Fiend, Alexa Bliss, and Aleister Black. I, I And we'll get into my draft predictions here in a little bit. But Sorry, um, sure I really think that. that's going to be incredible. Uh, my, uh, my Amazon speaker just went off in the background. I don't know if you heard that because I said Miss Bliss's first name. That happens to me from time to time when I'm watching SmackDown and all of a sudden Miss Bliss's first name is said and my device, uh, in, in my kitchen goes off. It's, it's actually really funny. But, um, I, I think a stable between those three could be incredible with the fiend leading it and manipulating all of them. I would love to see that. Carmella is back. We'll see how that goes. Uh, I've always been a big fan of Carmella. Maybe not as big of a fan as Corey Graves is, but I think that's going to be absolutely great. I'm really happy to see her back. We'll see what they do with her. Hopefully she stays on SmackDown, and I think that's going to be great. I'm not... Well, so next week... So Sasha Banks came back. We're getting Sasha Banks versus Bayley for the SmackDown Women's Championship next uh, this coming Thursday. I think that's going to have draft implications, which I'm going to talk about here in a little bit. The, unless the, this is, there's going to be a screwy finish here and then they, they stay on the same brand and it sets up something in Hell in the Cell. But, so I'm not quite sure why we're getting Bailey and Sasha, uh, this coming week. I think they should have either delayed it to Hell in, Hell in the Cell or to somewhere down the road. I think it's going to have draft implications, which, uh, we'll get to here in a little bit. I'm going to talk a little bit about Raw, a little bit about AEW, and then I'm going to get into my, a little bit of my draft predictions. Part of it is what I would like to see. I don't know if I would call them actual predictions because I really have no idea what WWE is going to do. But we'll get into that here in a little bit. Really, really enjoyed Raw this week. Um, I thought it was a really, really good show. Um, Randy Orton and Seth Rollins may both be the best iterations of themselves yet. I mean, Randy Orton is acting like a serial killer. 
uh, with, and just his acting skills are incredible. And Seth Rollins, I mean, my goodness. I mean, what can you say about the Messiah? Uh, you know, he is the Messiah for a reason. What he is, his, what he's doing with, with Buddy Murphy and the, and the entire, well, Murphy and the entire Mysterio family is great. It's, it's, it's helping to showcase Dominic Mysterio as an upcoming talent. I have all the belief that Dominic Mysterio has the skills to be a WWE main eventer. So I, but Randy Orton and Seth Rollins, again, they may be the best versions of themselves yet. Uh, to the big storyline coming out of Raw, I think is Mustafa Ali being revealed as the leader of Retribution. Um, you know, you could say if you're thinking of other storylines involving it being revealed, he could say he's the president of Retribution, giving a nod to Aces and Eights and Bully Ray. But I like it. I like Mustafa Ali as the leader of Retribution. Gives him something to do. There was rumors that he was part of the hacker gimmick a while ago. So I, I, for me, there's a little bit of a tie in there because Mustafa Ali is leading this renegade group. And, you know, he's been doing, you know, he has a lot of work behind the scenes as the hacker gimmick. And now with him leading Retribution, I like it. I, I've always believed in Mustafa Ali. So I, I, I think they should have done it at either the final segment of Raw or at one of the, at either the top of the, the nine o'clock or the ten o'clock hour, but you know they did it in the penultimate segment, so that kind of for me lost a little bit of its of its edge. I wish they would have put it in a different part of the show, but I'm happy Mustafa Ali is a part of uh, Retribution. I think that's going to be great for him and great for the group. Uh, real quick, talk about AEW really quick. Um, you've already heard the things that I disliked about the show, and by and large, it was a terrible show, but. That being said, it was cool to have a lot of celebrities reaching out to Chris Jericho. I thought that was really cool from the world. A lot of uh, rock stars reaching out to him, uh, Gene Simmons, Lars Ulrich, and others. I thought that was really, really cool uh, to tie into Jericho's uh, relationship with Fozzie and what he's doing with them. So I thought that was really cool. I still think Jericho is one of the best entrance themes in all of professional wrestling. I love Judas and when the crowd sings. I think that's really cool. A uh, good match between Big Swole and Serena Deeb. It's Serena Deeb is obviously there as the veteran to help put over the younger talent, and that's fine. I don't have a problem with that at all. They need to bring in people like that to boost uh, AEW's women's division because, I, as I've said before, I think AEW's women's division, minus Britt Baker, and now a little bit Big Swole, but by and large, it's tragic. The talent is there. They're just not being used properly or booked properly at all. Of course, you could say that about all of AEW, but that's another segment for another time. Uh, and then just finally, um, congratulations to Chris Jericho for 30 years in the wrestling business. I, I, Chris Jericho is without a doubt one of the greatest of all time. No doubt about it. He'll go down as one of the top performers. He's hilarious both inside of the ring, outside of the ring. Everything he does is gold. So congratulations to Le Champion and, and everything he's done in the world of professional wrestling. I think it's absolutely great. Okay. Let's get into some of my draft. And I'm going to say it, it's really tough to say what's going to happen in the draft. You never know what they're going to do. I'm going to share with you what I would like to see happen. And then you can, and we'll we'll see what happens starting this Friday on SmackDown. And then of course, next Monday on Raw. I would love to see the following folks go to SmackDown. Aleister Black, Kevin Owens, Peyton Royce, and Angel Garza. I think that Black uh, should go to SmackDown, be a part of the, of the stable with the Fiend. Kevin Owens can draft in SmackDown to feud with them. There's no reason to keep the Iconics together anymore. I think that you can send Peyton Royce over to SmackDown, let her do her thing on her own. I don't know what you do with Billy Kay. Um, keep her on Raw, I guess, or potentially, or potentially have her go to NXT. And I, and I think that could be all right too. I know NXT is not a part of this draft, but we're actually going to get to that here in a little bit. To go to Raw, uh, the folks I'd like to see go to Raw, Sasha Banks, Braun Strowman officially moving over to Raw. He's been doing it with Raw Underground, but I'd like to see Braun Strowman to Raw, AJ Styles, and actually Shorty G. I'd like to see them go to Raw. Uh, Sasha Banks, I, the reason I think we're getting Sasha and Bailey this week on SmackDown is because I think that so- they're going to split them up, send Sasha Banks over to Raw, which is fine. They don't need to be together anymore, and in a moment's notice, if you need to, you can just... You basically put pause on that feud, and then when you need to, if WWE struggling with with creative for for the women's divisions, just bring bring them back together and have them refeud or do what they need to do. Those storylines write themselves. 
Strowman works on Rob. Get him away from the Fiend. He can just be kicking ass. Um, I like him against Keith Lee. I think that could be a cool program. Give them a little more time to do what they're going to do. AJ Styles, get him away from Paul Heyman. Um, I think AJ Styles is being lost in the shuffle a little bit on Raw. And I, I actually think after Hell in the Cell, whoever is the WWE champion, AJ, I, would, I hope it's Drew McIntyre, but I think AJ Styles is the next challenger for the WWE championship on Raw. And then Shorty G, just I, I like Shorty G. I think he has potential. So I'll put him over on Raw, let him see what he can do in the mid-card, and hopefully he can have some success over there. The other two things I would like to see... Send Cesaro and Nakamura to Raw, and then ha- and then unify the tag team titles. You don't need to have tag teams on both shows. It's not necessary. There isn't enough tag teams to have a SmackDown tag team champion and a Raw tag team champion. So send Cesaro and Nakamura to Raw, unify the titles, have them drop them to the Street Profits, and then split Cesaro and Nakamura up. And I actually think what should happen, what I'd like to see happen, Cesaro go to NXT UK, and Nakamura go to NXT and re- and bring back the face, the theme song. He was amazing in NXT. So I would. That's what I would love to see. If they do bring NXT, they haven't advertised NXT, but if they do, bring Johnny Gargano and Candice LeRae up to Raw. The rest of NXT, leave it where it is. I'd like to see Gargano and LeRae up on Raw, and then since Nakamura. Cesaro to NXT UK. If you need to put a female down there to balance Candice LeRae, send Billy Kay down there. Um, I say down there. Send Billy Kay to NXT. She could bring some veteran presence to that division, and I think that'd be great. So that's what I would like to see with the draft, and those are the thoughts of Derrico this week. Again, leading up the next few weeks, my final thought is, remember, doesn't matter what side of the fence you fall on politically. Vote, 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 vote. If you're on the right, vote. If you're on the left, vote. Just make sure that your voice is heard. This has been The Thoughts of Derrico. You're smarter now, man.